I asked um, most of you if you were holy, you might stop and think about it for a moment. All right? Now, some of you might say, oh, yeah, I'm holy because you know you're supposed to say that. All right? But some of you may sit there and say, oh, no, I'm not holy. I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. But you know what? We are called to be holy. God calls us to be holy. He says to be holy like he is holy. And that's a struggle for a lot of us. You know, we, we, we know what we're like. We know what we're capable of. We know what our thoughts are like. And so we have a hard time thinking that we can be holy people. And yet that's exactly what we are called to be. Today we're continuing in our series in 1 Peter. We call it the Rock Speaks because Peter means rock. And so he is talking to us. He's telling us, encouraging us. He's especially encouraging the Christians of his time who were going through persecution, who were really struggling because of all the persecution that was coming at them. And so they were struggling very much. And so I think it's very um, good for us to look at it today because we go through struggles too. Maybe not the persecution they were going through because for most of us here, we probably aren't going to be um, threatened with death. Uh, it may come, I don't know. But probably most of us, that's probably not going to happen. But there are going to be other things that we're going to go through, things that we're going, we're going to have to deal with. And so Peter tells us about these things and helps to encourage us. And so today I want to read what he reads, what he says here in 1 Peter, starting with uh, verse 13. We're going to read through chapter 2, verse 3. And then we're going to come back and see what he's talking about. Okay? This is what it says. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you have when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's works impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb, without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. He was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. He tells us to be holy. He tells us to be holy. Now, sometimes we have a hard time with that word. We think to be holy means to be perfect. And in a sense, it does. But basically, the whole idea of the word is to be set apart. To be set apart. And, and when he says to be set apart here, he's really referring to be, being set apart from the rest of the world. That when we have accepted Christ, we look at what he has done for us, and we see that he has given his life for us, and we accept that, and accept the forgiveness that comes through his death, and his resurrection, <coughs> We're to be set apart from the rest of the world. We're to be different. There should be a difference in us if we are in Christ. You know, God calls us to come to Him as we are. But He doesn't expect us to stay that way. He expects for His Holy Spirit to come in us and to transform us, to change us, to make us what God desires for us to be. He wants us to be holy. To be like Him. And so, how do we do that? 
You know, when we talk about being holy, we hear that quite a bit, that we're supposed to be holy. How do you do that? And I think Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, gives us some ideas in this passage that we need to understand. And one thing that he says is that we set ourselves apart by purifying ourselves. We are set apart by purifying ourselves. In other words, getting rid of all the stuff that is in there that we need, that is not good. All that that makes us uh, unclean. We set apart ourselves by purifying ourselves. But the question is, how, we, how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we purify ourselves? How do we make ourselves clean? How do we set ourselves apart from the rest of the world? Well, I think there's a few things that he says in here that helps us to understand that. The first thing is that we set ourselves apart by obeying the truth. By obeying the truth. We have a hard time sometimes with obedience. At least I do. I don't know about you all. When my parents told me to do something, if I didn't want to do it, I didn't always do it. Of course, you know what happened then. I got into trouble. I got grounded, or I got spanked, or something else would happen. You know, they take something away from me or whatever. When I disobeyed, they were punished me for it. But it tells us we're to obey the truth. Jesus said something that is, is interesting. He said that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. He said if you love me, you will obey my commandments. What does loving him got to do with obeying? And you think about that just a little bit, you realize really what it means is when you obey someone, you're doing what pleases them. If you love someone, you want to do what pleases them. It, I remember when uh, Karen and I first started dating. You know, I wanted to do anything to please her. However, one day, I was going up to her dorm. We were there at Cincinnati Christian University, and I was in the men's dorm, which is way down the hill. She lived up in the middle of my hall, which is way up the hill. So as I was tripsing up there, it was about this time of year, and I found a, a woolly worm. Okay? A woolly worm. And I just saw it, and I thought, I'll pick this up. And so as I was going there, all of a sudden, I, got, I came up with this bright idea. All right? And... Um, Probably really wasn't that bright. But anyhow, <laughs> so I go up there, and um, she comes down from her room, and, and I said, close your eyes. I said, hold out your hand. <laughs> and I put that woolly worm in her hand. <laughs> and she starts putting her hand around, and all of a sudden, she screamed loud. I mean, everybody in the dorm had to hear it. And um, I found out that did not please her. <laughs> you know, not very much. Here's the thing. What pleases God is when we obey Him. And the reason it pleases Him is because He doesn't do it just to be a, a master and, and us be a slave. But He does it because He loves us and He knows what's best for us. When He asks us to obey His word, it's not so that He can just get on us when we've done something wrong. But it's because He knows what's best. His laws and rules are there for our benefit. In Romans 6, 16 and 17, it says this. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey in your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Here's the thing. We don't want to be anybody's slave, do we? But what he's telling us here is that we are. We're either a slave to sin or we're a slave to God. Whichever one we obey, that's the one we are the slave to. And so you may think that you are, when you disobey God, and you just disobey Him and it's just all about you. But no, it's not. If you're starting to obey your sinful nature, you're obeying that which is against God. It's not about you at all. But it's about who you're pledging allegiance to. To a sinful nature. Or to God who loves you and sent his son for you. And he says here in Romans, he says, but thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves of sin, you have come to obey from your heart, to obey from your heart, the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You know why he says obey from the heart? That it means you love God. 
You love Him because of what He's done for you. And so, you obey the truth. We also are set apart by purifying ourselves by being self-controlled. Now, this is probably one of those things that probably a lot of you have problems with. I do. Anybody else have problems with that? The other day I sat down and there was a bag of chips and I thought I'll just eat a few of these chips. Half a bag later, I finally put them up. Self-control is one of those things that we, that we have struggles with, isn't it? But it shouldn't be. Notice what it says in 1 Timothy 1, 7. It says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. That of power and love and what? Self-control. He said he gave us that spirit. Think about it for a moment. When you read the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter 5, what, there's one thing in there at the very end that we tend to do, to kind of ignore. And it says one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. When God's Spirit is in us, we have the ability to control ourselves. If we want. If we'll trust in the power of God to ch help us to control those urges that we have. Those sinful urges. Those urges to, to be lazy. Those urges to do what we want to do. The Spirit is there to help control those. We don't have to give in to those. But the problem is, why did I eat those, that whole half a bag of chips the other day? Because I wanted to. I could have controlled myself. I could have stopped. Matter of fact, after I ate about three or four, I thought, yeah, I thought I'd put these up. But I didn't. I kept eating them. The same thing's true of sin sometimes. We know it's bad for us. We know it's not any good for us, but sometimes we just want to. You know, we want to hold on to that pride because it feels good. At least we think. Or maybe we want to hold on to that, that anger, that bitterness, that rage. Because it makes us feel good when we uh, can just let somebody have it. Or maybe you know, we think, well, just want to look at that website won't be a problem. We've got to be self-controlled. And by being self-controlled, that makes us holy because guess what? The rest of the world out there, they aren't self-controlled. You can see that. Matter of fact, I don't know if you've been following the news here recently, but all the sexual harassment things that are going on out there, people aren't self-controlled. All the greed that we see out there, all the things in the news where People are shooting other people because they've got something they want or because they're angry with them or for whatever reason. Because there's no self-control. But for us as God's people, we need to be set apart by being self-controlled. And we don't have to do it on our own. We've got God's Spirit there to help us, to enable us to be self-controlled. And so we just need to start trusting in that power that we have. Another thing that he tells us is that we can set ourselves apart by craving pure spiritual milk. Craving pure spiritual milk. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, what does that mean? Spiritual milk. What's he talking about? And I think what he's talking about is this. His word. To crave it, to want it more than anything else. I was talking to a gentleman the other day. He was just kind of giving his life to Christ in the last couple months. And I thought it was interesting. He said since then, he's read through the entire, entire Bible twice. Okay, twice. In two months. I was sitting there thinking, wow. Now he is retired. Okay, that does help him a little bit, but still, that's a lot of reading in two months' time, but he says he just can't get enough. And how many of us feel that way about God's Word? Especially those of us who have been Christians for a while. You know, sometimes we know we need to get into God's Word, but sometimes we're like, ah, okay, I'll, I'll get it out and read it. Or maybe we just leave it sit there. Knowing that it is what feeds us. 
when we went out to um, Washington back in the end of uh, August, beginning of September there to see our, our new granddaughter, Junia, it was interesting. You knew when she was hungry. Right? There was no doubt about it. And we think she was going to get through a growth spurt that period because afterwards she got through all of her clothes just about. But she was eating like every two hours. I mean, it was just like she had to have it. She just wanted it now. And, it, you know, there was no waiting for her. As soon as she stuck that bottle in her mouth, you know, she was just on it. She just couldn't get enough. I think that's what we need to be doing with God's word. It needs to become something that we desire more than anything else. Because where do we get the help that we need? Where do we, how do we grow? It's through God's word. How do we become more like God? How do we become holy? By knowing God's word, allowing it to come into us and change us and transform us. In Romans, and this is a verse I quote a lot, but I think it's a key verse for us as Christians. It tells us that we need to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In other words, we need to change the way we think. And how can we change that? It's only through God's word. As we read it, he changes how we think about things. And I'll be honest. Sometimes I'm thinking a lot like the rest of the world. You know, I see what they're saying and think what they're doing and thinking, oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden I realize, oh, no, that's not a good thing. And I've shared with you before, because this one just really, because this one time I really caught it, is uh, with the show Glee. I've told you this before, but I, I just, it just is one of those times that really got me. I'll never forget, I was watching a show, and in the show, there was this uh, male teacher, and there was this female teacher. The, the male teacher was married, and um, there was this relationship kind of developing between them. And his wife, of course, they were betraying her as really crazy and weird. And I found myself starting to root for him to get with the other woman. And one day I just thought, what are you, why are you feeling this way? And it's because they were leading me to feel that way. The show was just making you think he should be with this woman instead of his wife. That was the day I decided not to watch it anymore. Because I was starting to think like the rest of the world. And I needed to renew my mind. We've got to be careful about what we put in there, folks. And we're putting a lot of stuff from the media and, and from TV shows and movies and magazines and books and the internet. And there's so much stuff that's coming in that it's wanting to change the way we think. But God says, let me renew your mind. You're going to be set apart. Crave that pure spiritual milk so that you can be changed in the way you think. So you might grow in Christ and become more like Him. We also are set apart by loving our fellow Christians. By loving our fellow Christians, by loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's interesting, Peter says that we're supposed to love them deeply from the heart. Okay, deeply from the heart. That means with some emotion to really deeply care for one another. And that can only be done if we get to know one another. If we know each other. That's why it's so important to be involved in small groups, to be involved in Sunday school or, or something else. And, and coming together and being together as much as we possibly can. Because that's when we get to know each other. It's hard to love somebody that you see once a week. And that's why we really need to get together more often. And be with one another. And get to know each other. Because he says we're supposed to love each other deeply from the heart. In other words, when we see somebody hurting, when we see they need something in our family, we jump in and we do it. John 13, 35 says this. And this is the easy to read version. It says, all people will know that you are my followers if you love each other. Now, you get that underneath that line, that underline that I put there on it? If. <clears throat> if you love each other. All people will know that you are my followers if you love one another. Guess what he doesn't say? All people will know that you're my disciples if you come to church every Sunday. Didn't say that. He didn't say all people will know you're my disciples if you go to Sunday school. Didn't say that. He didn't say all people will know that you're my followers if you go to 
Fellowship dinners. Didn't say that. What he said, if you love each other. That's how people are going to know if we are his disciples. If we're fighting, if we're bickering, if we're talking badly about other people in our congregation, our, our family of God, and that's not showing love. And that's what shows out to the rest of people. We're just like everybody else. We have got to love one another so much that we protect one another and are there for each other. The rest of the world, they fight and they bicker and they, uh, they don't show love except to those who love them back. We love one another deeply from the heart. And that's what shows that we are set apart from the rest of the world. And then, of course, we also set ourselves apart by getting rid of some things, right? by purifying ourselves. And there are several things that he mentions here that we're supposed to rid ourselves of. The first one is malice. And that's basically the idea of desiring evil for, to another person. You want something just bad to happen to them. And um, I remember when I was in high school, and this is something I'm not proud of, and I don't know if I've ever told you all about this, but my best friend just lived a couple doors down from me. I think that's why he's my best friend, to be honest with you, just because sometimes I say your friends are more about proximity than anything else, and he just lived a couple doors. So we hung around quite a bit. Well, he had a friend who um, dated this one girl, and then she just broke up with this guy. And he was really upset with her. Thing is, she lived next door to him. And so he came up with this plan that we were going to go to her house, and we were going to toilet paper it, put Vaseline on the door handles, do a bunch of other stuff, all right? I didn't have any problem with what happened, but I wouldn't want to with him. But he was so upset with her. He wanted bad things to happen to her. And I went along with it. And that's what we're talking about, malice. When you just want something bad to happen to somebody else. And he says, we need to rid ourselves of that. We should never want revenge. We should never want something to happen to a fellow human being. And especially somebody in the church family. We've got to get rid of that. It also says to get rid of all deceit. And that's basically the idea of concealing or misrepresenting the truth. In other words, lying. We need to get rid of that. That needs to not be a part of us. It has to be gone because that's what the world is, isn't it? There's so much deceit out there, so much lying going on, so much quote unquote fake news that goes on. And by fake news, I mean us. So we need to be careful that we, we need to get rid of that and get that out of our lives. If we're going to be different, if we're going to be holy people, if we're going to be set apart, deceit has to be gone. Hypocrisy. That's the idea of not living according to your beliefs. <laughs> oh boy. Now that means something, doesn't it? It means every one of us here is probably a hypocrite. Okay, anybody do everything exactly according to what you believe? Okay. I heard about a girl recently who said she was a, a vegetarian. She only ate chicken. <laughs> I thought, really? I don't think that's a vegetarian, but uh, she has a whole different idea of what a vegetarian is than I do. But, you know, hypocrisy is one of the things that really everybody in some way does. But we as Christians need to really guard ourselves of that. And not think it's okay, you know, it's, it's all right, God's going to forgive me. It doesn't really matter if I don't quite live up to this. Because if we're going to be set apart, then we've got to practice what we preach. If we believe something is true, then we need to obey it and live it out. And so hypocrisy is something we need to get rid of. Envy is another thing. Envy is discontent caused by others' good fortune. Hmm. Get that? It's when something good happens to somebody, you get envious. You get a, you feel bad because something good happened to them. You know, why did it happen to them? You know, how come they get all the luck? You ever feel that way? You know? You know last night I was uh, very envious of the Iowa fans. In case you don't know. I'm a high State fan. High State got me pretty good last night. So anyhow, 55 to something. But anyhow, it was bad. But I was kind of envious. Right? But envy is that idea that when something good happens to somebody else, we wish it would have happened to us and not to them. It's really a discontent, a, a bad feeling. In some ways, it's, it's a lack of gratitude 
for what God has provided for us. When we start comparing what we have or don't have to somebody else, we need to look and see what God has done for us. So we need to get rid of envy. We also need to get rid of slander. And slander is that idea of making false statements about someone. Making false statements about someone. In other words, don't gossip. Right? If you don't know something to be the truth, don't tell somebody else. And even if you think it might be the truth, you might stop and think about whether or not to share that or not. Because guess what? It might not be the truth. I've had people tell me stuff before, and then I find out that it's not true. You know? And I don't think that person lied to me on purpose. They thought they were telling the truth, but they weren't. So we need to be careful about making statements about other people that make sure that what we say is the truth. Because we're supposed to rid ourselves of slavery. That's what the rest of the world does. They share all this stuff and talk about everybody. And they don't care whether it's true or not. We need to be set apart and get rid of that. And the last thing he tells us that we set ourselves apart by not conforming to our evil desires. That's really what it comes down to. Not conforming to our evil desires. Those things that we feel, those, those temptations that come on <coughs> not giving in to them. Not conforming to them. The idea of conforming means you know, put into that mold. Let it get shaped us. You ever think about that? Your desires, especially the evil ones, they're shaping you. They're making you into a person that maybe you don't want to be. It's interesting. God talks about a potter and that the potter makes the things. You know, he uses the wheel and shapes things. I never tried them. Has anybody ever tried doing, doing the potter wheel? I think it'd be kind of fun. The thing is, God is the one who's supposed to form us. And yet when we give in to these evil desires, we're allowing those to shape us and to mold us. And the world looks at us through that. And we are not setting ourselves apart. We're just being like everyone else. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, it says this. For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Remember when we started this series, we talked about how we are chosen. That when we choose God, He has already chosen us. He's chosen us and all we have to do then is to choose Him, to follow Him. And it tells us here that He chose us to be holy and blameless. He desires us to be holy. He's done all that He can to make us that way. He's purified us through His Son, Jesus Christ, through His death on the cross. Through his blood that was shed to bring us forgiveness. He's given us the Holy Spirit who enables us to live our life in a way that pleases and honors God. The question is, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Peter tells us, obey the truth. Be self-controlled. Crave pure spiritual milk. Love your fellow Christians. And get rid of malice, deceit, and the hypocrisy and slander. And quit conforming to those evil desires. That's how we become holy. And so if you say, what? Be holy? Yes. You holy. Be holy. Just as God is holy. Let's become imitators of God as dearly loved children. Just a moment, we're going to sing our song commitment. And um, the song we're going to use is Tis the Sweet to Trust in Jesus. And uh, the reason I chose this song is because that's where it starts. And if we want to be holy, it starts with trusting God. Trusting that where He's going to take us to, what He's going to ask us to do is what's best for us. It's when we think that we know better that the problem comes along. So it's so sweet to trust in Jesus know him. If you've got a decision to make, if you'd like to know Jesus today, if you'd like to know more about what it means to follow him, what it means to become holy, then we ask you to come. And like I said, you come the way you are and let Jesus then change you. Let God's Spirit mold you and transform you into what he desires. But maybe you've already accepted Christ, but you're struggling with some things. we got people who are willing to pray with you. They're willing to be there with you and talk to you. 
So if you need to come down as, as we sing the song, or if you want, just uh, come up here afterwards and we'll go ahead and talk to you. Let's stand and listen.